is a voice that speaks There is a voice that speaks to my fearful heart It tells me you're not far It's in the words I read In the words I read I see the red letters are Love pouring from your scars Speak to me, speak to me, speak to me Jesus connects them so clearly 
But anyways, I, I, I would I would be hesitant to argue too much with them. But first of all, it's written to the church in Rome. Let me just make that clear. It's not just a letter to, hey, if you're in Rome, just by the way, take a... It's written to the church in Rome. They were already Christians. They were already immersed believers. And the idea was, and I don't know if this is all about this, but I know that emperor worship was on the rise. And you're going to hear more of this as we go through these seven letters. Emperor worship was on the rise, and the soldiers, Roman soldiers, would literally put a spear to your throat and say, declare Caesar as Lord. And if you didn't, they wouldn't necessarily cut your throat, but they could. And so that's where that has originated from. Some of that is in there. So when you, so when you hear that, take that with a grain of salt. That Paul isn't saying, you just need to believe in your heart and confess Jesus. He's saying, look, there's some persecution that's taking place in the areas around you. So if it comes your way, don't hesitate to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Okay, so that's what's going on here in Smyrna for sure. They would put a sword to your throat or a spear to your throat and say, you know, confess Caesar as Lord. And the people would do it. And they'd get that token. And with that token, again, they can live normal lives. The Christians did. So you can imagine there was some persecution that took place. You can imagine there was some suffering that took place uh, with those Christians there as well. But listen, guys, we, we all understand suffering. We all get it. I don't need to stand here and explain it um, and, and try to break it down. We, we know what suffering is all about, all right? This message today isn't going to be one where you're going to be like, yeah! Okay, this is, this is a heavy message. This is, deals with, with suffering. Okay, and, and here's the deal. You have suffered, you are suffering, or you will suffer. And <laughs> you think, boner message, dude, but, but seriously, that's... That's the gist of it, guys. That's the reality. We live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. And suffering is part of this. But we know that when we read the words of this book aloud, and when we hear the words and we take to heart what is written in it, we know there's a blessing because we looked at that last week. So we are blessed today just to be able to go through these words and hear the message that Jesus has. He has a special message for that church that was, that was suffering. And the same message is going to be fitting for us as well. So when suffering comes to your doorstep, knocks on the door, and kicks it in like Chuck Norris, you'll know what to do, okay? All right, guys, so if you guys are ready, let's go ahead and open up Revelation chapter 2. We'll start, bless you, in verse 8. All right, Jesus says this, to the angel, that is to the, the messenger, to the preacher, to the pastor, to the minister of the church in Smyrna, writes, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. Okay, guys, I love that. Uh, you're you're going to find it as we go through the letters, all seven letters, and, and again, I, I get so excited about God's Word. It's so awesome. I love how God puts things in there, and they seem so subtle. I mean, you, if you read it at first glance, you bounce right past it, you don't catch it, and as you dig down deeper, you get, there's so much depth. It, just in that introduction, all seven letters, Jesus will introduce himself, which is nice, because in our letters, right, they, it's not like that. Very like, dear Bob, and then you got to read the letter, and you got to like flip pages to read the bottom to who signed it so you know who wrote it. Not so. Jesus is given a description of who he is. And all seven letters are going to have different descriptions. And it's not just because he has so many titles and so many ways to describe himself. It's because they're specific for that church. There's one coming up in a couple weeks, and I'm like spastic. I can't wait to share with you how cool it is. But still, this is really cool. He says, I am the first... And I am the last. I'm the one who died and, and, and is living, again, came to life, okay? And you think, okay, yeah, cool. And then you read on and you kind of skip it. But just for them to hear that, just that introduction, they already have strength. They're already getting hope. They're already getting encouragement. There's peacefulness in that. Because he's saying, look, I, I, I'm going to understand you're going through some suffering. As a church, you're suffering. You're being persecuted. But you know what? I'm the first and I'm the last. And you know what? Suffering isn't going to have the last word. And that's good for us too, right? Because suffering will not have the last word. We understand the first and last. Jesus was here. There was nothing. There was Jesus. Oh, of course, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But Jesus is here in the beginning. And there's nothing. And then creation begins. And he takes part in creation. And everything that we know and things that we don't even know, which is super epic, have been created. And then, boom, history starts. And it's set in motion. And history is running its course. And it's still running its course. There's a day when it's going to stop. And history will be all done, everything is over, and Jesus will remain. He's saying, you're, you're going to suffer, but you're not going to have the last word. Suffering won't have the last word. I will have the last word. So that, that's good news for them. And, then, and, and it goes on. Because listen, 
I get it. Some of you guys, for me to stand here right now and tell you that I understand all the ins and outs of suffering, that I, that I understand all the mysteries of God in regards to suffering, it, it wouldn't be fair to say because I don't. It's just, I just, I don't. And we, we ask why, right? How many of you guys have asked why going through suffering? Honestly, yes. Me too. I'm going to help you answer the why today by the time we're done, okay? I don't know all the answers, but, but I, I, I can help you with the why, okay? So listen, here's the deal. If you're here this morning and you are suffering, why don't you just, just take a moment, all right? Just take a moment, close your eyes, and I just want you to picture Jesus with his, with his arms stretched out on the cross, nailed to the cross. I want you to have that image. Now, I know he's not on the cross, okay? I want you to get that image for just a moment because, guys, he suffered. He suffered and he died. He gets it. He understands what you're going through. But he says, I'm alive. And so that's the really great news. It's not just good news. It's great news. It's the best news ever, right? Because he's alive. We don't serve a, a dead God. We don't pray to a dead God. We pray to and serve a living God. And so he died. He suffered and died. So he understands where you're at. So take some encouragement in that. Okay? Just take some hope and some peacefulness in that. All right? And again, this is just the introduction. I could probably go another 10 minutes on this. It's, this is how awesome this is. And Jesus just says, I want you to know, because the message will continue with, uh, with that uh, suffering and the persecution and things to come. But he says, just in my intro, I want you to understand who I am. It, who I am. And I'm writing to you. So guys, so that's the intro. And then he, he jumps in from there. In verse 9, he actually begins the body of the message here. And he says this. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and they are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Oh, okay, so, so here's what we know about these, uh, these guys so far. The, the church, the Christians there in Smyrna. Uh, they're, they're undergoing great persecution. They, they could go to their job, and this is serious. Their, their boss could say, uh, confess Caesar. No, I'm a Christian. Well, you don't have a job. Beat it. They could say that. They could go home, and their landlord could say, confess Caesar as Lord. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm a Christian. Well, then move out because you don't have a home. We already know that they couldn't buy food without that token, so, so things are difficult. So in a real sense, there's some homelessness. There's real poverty, as Jesus says. He's not just saying you're poor in spirit. Uh, they could have been that as well, uh, very easily. But he's saying, your poverty, I see it, I get it, I understand. I understand, really, I do, but you're rich. And you might think that's really weird for him to say that. And in fact, the Greek word that he uses <coughs> signifies someone who has authority with their wealth. And you might think that's really odd, because that does sound kind of odd. But guys, listen, they were rich in God's sight. They stored up for themselves treasures in heaven. You see, we hear that phrase, that's a churchy phrase, treasure in heaven stored up. Well, what does that even mean? Well, there, there's a lot to that. There, there's a whole bunch. Like some of it is just, just, our, just our lives, our service to the Lord, the things that we do. We're, we're doing things for Him. That's a way of storing up those things in heaven, storing for us treasures in heaven, rewards, blessings, however you want to you word that. But also, guys, listen, if you have a loved one that has died and passed on is with the Lord right now, you've got treasure in heaven. Isn't that cool? Some of you do. Steve, I know you do. We talked about this in Sunday school class three, four weeks ago. We talked about it in men's group as well. Tough week for you last week. I told you I was praying for you. I was. Steve's got treasure stored up in heaven. Craig, I don't see you. He's here somewhere. Hey, Craig. Wait. Oh, there you are. Craig. Yes, treasure stored up in heaven, my friend. That's fresh. That still hurts. There's suffering in there. It's bittersweet. It's sweet because our loved ones are, are at peace. No more pain, no more sighing, no more crying, no more dying. But it's bitter for us because we're still here. And it's tough and we're without them. So we get it. That's our treasure in that. So there's suffering that we have here. There's, there's pain that we go through. There are difficult moments. Jesus says, guys, I know. I see it. I see what's going on. I see the affliction. I see it. I get the struggle. I totally understand one billion percent. 
And then he says this to them. He's building them up. And then he says this in verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. And you got to thinking, wait, wait a sec, time out. Can we go back to verse 8? I like verse 8. You read the letter over, start in the beginning. I like the intro. I, I like how I, I had some peace and it was some strength and, and I got some encouragement from that part. But you're telling me now there's more? Come on, I mean, we've been suffering. We're suffering now. And you're telling us there's more suffering. And don't be afraid of what's going to happen to us. Not exactly a pep talk that you wanted to hear, right? But he's not done. He continues in verse 10. He says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Again, it doesn't seem to be much better, does it? It just keeps getting worse and worse. Uh, now, remember, when you, when you see a number in Revelation, don't count it. Weigh it. Okay? Just like the seven spirits. It wasn't seven spirits. It's seven. It's a perfect number. It's the Holy Spirit. Same thing with this. Ten is a large number. There were two options, basically, that you were going to uh, face if you were thrown into prison in this time, in this first century, okay? Um, one was a very short stay, not ten days, very short stay. They would take you, uh, they, and as the, the Roman guards, soldiers, they would take you off the streets, throw you in prison, beat you to within an inch of your life, and then throw you back out in the streets. Sometimes it was overnight, if they had a little bit of fun, maybe it was a day, but, uh, but honestly it was a very quick turnaround. They beat you, they chuck you back out in the street. Didn't matter if it was 2 or 3 a.m., they didn't care, they just throw you back out. The other option, <laughs> option as if you get to choose, uh, the other option or scenario was they take you, they drag you off the streets, they put you in prison, they beat you to within an inch of your life again, but then you stay there. You never leave. I think that's what Jesus is saying because it's 10, it's a, it's a large number. He's saying some of you, you're suffering now, but some of you are going to be thrown into prison. You're going to be beaten. You're going to experience even more pain and suffering, and you're never getting out. You're going to die there. So now you're thinking, wow, bummer message. Bummer for sure. But Jesus isn't done yet. Here's the message he has for him, continuing in verse 10. He says, be faithful. I, I love that. Be faithful. I see what you've gone through. I know where you're at, what you're going through. There's more ahead of you. Be faithful. Be faithful. And he continues and says, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Guys, we, we say things we don't mean. We say things all the time. Not, not that we're lying. We're not, but we stretch. Right? We exaggerate. Some hyperboles, they're all over the place. I, how many of you at work have had like your boss pile on extra work and you've said something similar to, man, I think my boss is trying to kill me. You ever have that? Yeah. Tom's like, yep. He can't even stretch far enough. Yeah. Yeah, so you, so you understand. It's not really trying to kill you. It's just giving you a lot of extra work, but it feels, it's frustrating, it's difficult. How, how many, uh, in the same token, it was hot Friday. How many were outside Friday? Hot. Yeah, like, ah, you got to say it that way, it was so bad. I went outside working on sermon, I stood under the tree over there, I lost like seven pounds, just sweating out. Oh my goodness, it was so hot. As I walked back into the building, I was thinking, even, even in the midst of the sermon, I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm dying out here. Right? You got to say that? It's like, yeah, we say those words, don't we? How about this? Some of you right now are probably thinking, yeah, we got to get going, I'm starving, finish up so we can go to lunch. Tom, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the honesty. <laughs> we, we say those things. We don't really mean them. Right? We, I mean, they're, it's not that they're lies. We just stretch it. Like I said, a hyperbole. Or a hyperbole, I used to call it before I knew how to pronounce it. It's, it's just an exaggeration. Right? But when these guys said it, they meant it. If, if one of these guys at the church was saying, look... Here's the deal. I think my boss is trying to kill me. It was true. That was, that was the real deal. There was no pretend about that. It wasn't fake. If somebody said, I'm dying, they were dying. Somebody said, I'm starving. They really were starving. I mean, they couldn't buy food. So they, the best they could get was just scraps or sharing with other Christians. I mean, that was it. They said they're starving. They really, really were. It was the real deal. Guys, listen. If you miss everything, and I hope you don't, <laughs> but... But if you miss everything this morning, don't miss this. Jesus doesn't call us to be successful. He doesn't command us to be successful. 
He commands us to be faithful. We're going to go through difficulties. It's going to happen. There are trials, there are tough times, there's persecution, which, I mean, listen, let's be honest, we live in nice, quiet Goshen, Indiana. Right? Nice, quiet Nepal. We don't really get persecution a whole lot here. But suffering, we understand. That's everywhere. This is going to happen. And in the midst of that, when Jesus says, when it happens, be faithful. Be faithful even to the point of death. Meaning, meaning no matter what, you stay faithful, you stay committed, because at the end of that, guys, there's a crown of victory. And that is good news. That's an amen right there for sure. And then Jesus continues. Wrapping it all up. Verse 11, he says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Be faithful. Be faithful. Simple words. Two words. Be faithful. We could have gone up here and I could have said, alright, good morning church. Be faithful. Let's pray. And gone out of here. But I don't know that we would get it. Listen, there are three takeaways I want to share with you this morning. One, don't be surprised by suffering. This is don't. No, it's going to happen. There's going to be a point where you're going to go through something, it's going to be difficult, and you're going to experience suffering. It's just, it's, it's a part of life. How many of you, okay, by a show of hands, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. How many of you have had trouble? Man, look at all the liars in here. There's like a whole lot of hands now. Like, I know some of you are just, some of you are shy and you don't raise your hand no matter what. You're like, raise your hand if you love Jesus. There'd be somebody still going... I get it, I get it. I'm just picking on you, okay? Honestly, I think, honestly, we, we all, we all know trouble. We all know trouble. Sometimes trouble has a name. Oh, I look at you. They're, they're wonderful brothers and sisters. Yeah. Honestly, guys, though, but we know trouble. We understand that. Jesus says, you're, you're going to have, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Why are we surprised when it comes along, when it kicks in our door, and, and it starts coming in? Well, I, I don't understand that. We need, to, we need to be prepared for it because it's real. It happens. Paul says this. 2 Timothy 3.12, he says, In fact, everyone. So who? Everyone. Who? Shout it out. Everyone. 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 Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Guys, I don't know about you, but I want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Anybody with me? Yeah. It's the hand day. Sorry, I apologize for all the hand But yeah, I think we all do. Again, some of the chickens don't want to raise their hands. They're all like, yeah, of course I do. Yeah, yeah. I'm right there with you. You don't want to raise your hands. It's okay. I think, honestly, we're here for a reason. We're here because we want to know about Jesus. We want to learn about Him. We want, we want to share Him. That's why we do this whole year-long sermon series. It's not just about learning about Him. It's really getting to know Him. So we want to be like Him. We want to. So we're going to experience persecution. It's going to come our way. So don't be surprised. Guys, don't be surprised at suffering. Okay? Second, God sees our, our pain. He sees our suffering. He sees. And in the Old Testament, there's a name for God. It's El Rohi. I love that. It means the God who sees. And I find comfort in that. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, He sees. We don't need to do anything about it. We're going to get to that point too, okay? But he sees. That's good. There's never a point where God is saying, I wonder what's going on with Bob. He, he's never out of the loop. He created the loop. He is the loop, okay? So there's never a point. He knows what's going on at all times, all right? And then third, and this one is my favorite, my favorite takeaway here. God will never, ever waste a hurt. He will never, ever, ever ever waste a hurt. Ever. We go through things and we ask why. There's a why. There really is because God will never waste that hurt in your life. Now, let me share this with you. Your, you might not want to hear this, okay? But this is, this is where we're at. Your suffering is a gift to the church. Your suffering is a gift to the church. That's part of the why. Here's what I mean. Maybe someone in here, you, you, know what it, you know what it feels like to bury a child. Now, as a parent, I can't imagine how difficult that would be to bury a child. Now, some of you, you might know. You might understand the pain that goes with that and the hurt and the questioning. 
And you say, why? Well, it's because God is going to put someone in your life eventually that's gone through the same thing. But they don't know Jesus like you and they don't know how to deal. And they don't know how to cope. They don't even know how to take a breath. But you are going to be able to minister to them. You're going to be able to share Jesus with them, share peace and hope and love and encourage and strengthen them in ways that no one else in this room could possibly do because you've been there and you've done that. As hard as it was, as difficult as it was, as painful as it is, you've been there and you've done that. So you can share Jesus in a way that no one else can. I'll give you an example. Maybe some of you have have a suicide in your family. And again, even in the midst of that, you're, you're questioning why. And it's tough, I can tell you, I have. I have a suicide in my family. And it was my dad, and we were living together, and I was 15 and I found him. And for the longest time, not a day went by that I didn't, I didn't ask why. Until one day, as a youth minister, we had a lock-in event. We had kids show up. We had 32 kids. There was only eight in the youth group at that time, and 32 showed up. Praise God, that was awesome. We locked them in. I don't know who came up with that idea. Crazy people, I guess. We locked them in, and there was a, there was a young man there who was 14, and his mom had just committed suicide about a month ago, a month prior to that. And he stood off to the corner, he didn't get involved with games. He didn't interact. He didn't want to eat. He just, he just, he just didn't want to do anything in life. And I watched him as he just stood there crying for a moment. And I started to speak to him. And when I found this out, the why made sense. Not easy, but the why made sense. And I was able to share some hope and some peacefulness with him that no one else in that entire church could do because I've been there and I've done that. Your suffering is a gift to the church. Someone said this about suffering, it can make you bitter or it can make you better. Suffering can make you bitter or it can make you better. Two options with that. You can get all crabby, you can shout why, you can cry about it, which, which you have reason to cry, I'm sure, over the whatever that situation is, but you can shake your fist at God and you can curse Him and you can reject Him and you can walk away from Him and you can hold that bitterness in your heart your whole life, harboring that towards God because He took someone from you. But you know what? That someone was His. His anyways. We should be grateful that we have a God who is so loving that they bring that He brings them to be with Him. you can do that, and you can be bitter, or you can be better, knowing that your suffering is a gift for others. It's for you, and it's for others. Guys, here's the deal with suffering. We're all going to have it. We have a job today, we don't tomorrow. Our family loves us today, they hate us tomorrow. We have friends today, they walk away tomorrow. Health today, gone tomorrow. It's just, we live in a, in a fallen world, in a broken world. These things will happen. And along the way, we're going to have moments where we're going to suffer. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, be faithful. Be faithful. Two simple words. So difficult to, to live out. But he says, be faithful. Because guys, he is the first. He's the last. You see, that's why we go through this entire study. We don't want to just, again, learn about Jesus. We want to really know him. We, we want to we wanna know Him, we want to love Him, we want to serve Him, we want to share Him, we want to exemplify Him. And so that we get to the end when everything is over and everything is done and gone, but Jesus is there because He is the last. And we stand before Him and He says, well done, good and faithful servants. And we get that crown of victory. That's what it's all about. Because He's the last, we have that hope to look forward to. Guys, he's also the first. And so if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as Lord, as 
Christ Savior. If you don't know Him the way that we're talking about Him this morning, we want to help you get that right. And, and in just a moment, what we're going to do is really simple. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing a song together.